Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! BBC has revealed its highest paid on-screen earners after being forced to do so by the government. The figures reveal a noticeable gender pay gap with just two women in the top ten and the best paid man earning nearly five times his female equivalent. Well, the corporation published these salaries of everyone earning more than 150000 in bands of 50000 On top of the list is Chris Evans. The Radio 2 and former Top Gear presenter earns at least £2.2 .2 million. Pounds. Uh, next, Match of the Day host Gary Lineker, who's paid between £1.75 and £1.8 million pounds by the BBC. He's followed by the presenter Graham Norton on around £850,000. Highest earning woman on that list is Claudia Winkleman. Uh, the Strictly Come Dancing presenter is paid up to £500,000 a year. The next highest paid woman is Alex Jones, who earns between £400,000 and £450,000. Uh, then Fiona Bruce, who's paid around £350,000. She's paid, though, considerably less than her fellow newsreader, Hugh Edwards, who earns between £550 and £600,000. Uh, similarly, Michelle Hussain's £200 to £250,000 is uh, dwarfed by her Today programme co-host. That's John Humphreys, who's paid around £600,000. Of the 96 names on the list, 62 male, uh, 34 are female. The average man on the list is paid £295,000. And the average woman earns £210,000. Well, the Secretary of State for Digital Culture, Media and Sport said that it's right that the BBC publishes these salaries. This is licence fee payers' money. They need to know where the money is being spent and that they're getting that value for money. And I think by having that transparency, we have the opportunity to see where there's maybe gender pay gaps and where there's uh, issues about BAME uh, presenters perhaps not being paid as much as others. And Tony Hall, I'm really pleased that the Director General Tony Hall has said that he welcomes this because he wants to make sure that they do deal with any, uh, any misrepresentation of women, any underpayment of anybody, and that we get that gender pay gap dealt with. Uh, well, let's turn to our senior political correspondent, Beth Rigby, who joins us now from Westminster. Beth, very good afternoon to you. What have we learned today and what might it change? Well, Colin, I think we summed that up pretty well in those graphics. What we've learned today is there's a huge gender pay gap at the top of the BBC with just two out of the 12 top paid people being female, Alex Jones, as you mentioned, and Claudia Winkleman. And, and many uh, news reporters and presenters paid a lot less than their male counterparts. And actually, Jane Garvey, who is a presenter on Women's Hour, didn't see her name in the list. She said, she tweeted that the gender uh, pay gap, she said, we'll be discussing that uh, as we have done since 19... 46 on Women's Hour go in well, isn't it? Well, that's what Jane Garvey had to say. I can tell you privately, lots of female uh, people within the BBC frustrated by this, clearly when they're realising they're being paid a lot less the male counterparts and not sure why. A couple of the big paid stars have also tweeted. Gary Lineker, uh, you saw that there. He is earning an absolute packet, 1.75 million to 1.8 million pounds, saying, happy BBC salary day. I blame my agent and the other TV channels that pay more. Now, where do I put my tin helmet? And then Nikki Campbell, uh, the radio presenter, who's been paid between 400 100,000 to 450,000 pounds saying I've been on the network radio for 30 years this year every day I realize what a privilege this is and how lucky I am and I imagine there will be lots of people out there realizing and thinking well how lucky these people are and I think it goes back to this point about poachability now the BBC would argue that they pay these people a lot of money because otherwise the likes of Sky, the likes of ITV, uh, Netflix, Google would poach these people at huge sums to get them on their channels. Uh, that's what the kind of message is out from the BBC. But actually, lots of people internally in the BBC say, look, there isn't that much of a market. These people are maybe just being overpaid and Theresa May the Prime Minister definitely made an oblique reference I'd say to this in PMQs when she said that some people in the public sector are being very 
well paid. Well, BBC executives have got their tin hats on today, Colin, as they uh, face the music over these big salaries. But in the longer run, uh, they do need to try and equalise these pay differentials, maybe take people down uh, the pay salary or indeed it's a legacy issue perhaps where some of the big beasts of the past uh, that would on big salaries maybe 10 years ago I'm talking about John Humphrey Eddie Mayer he's on a lot of money uh, people like that uh, maybe as they go through the system uh, the pub the pay bill will come down because I can tell you that those big salaries that were being paid out maybe a decade ago it doesn't feel like the BBC are willing to pay them out anymore uh, I just mentioning John Humphrey's Beth, I mean, you know, 73, started working at the BBC when he was 66, and the comparisons being drawn, for instance, with Michelle Hussain, who earns about a third of what he's getting. But as you say, there are questions of experience and age. Uh, it, it's, it can, you know, it's more complex than a first blush might suggest. Of course, of course it's more complex. And you've got Nick Robinson in there who's on the Today programme. He's earning between 250 and 300, I think. Uh, you've got... Um, Michelle Hussein earning 250 to 300. But then you've got Sarah Montague, who pro rata is off the list because she earns, you know, up to £100,000 less than Nick Robertson pro rata and a lot less than John Humphreys. And you could argue that, well, yes, John's been in the business for a long time. But, but also, Colin, I would say, um, and I know this from when I was the media editor at the time, so I used to cover the BBC very intensely, that also these big names in the BBC earn quite a lot of money externally from the BBC using that BBC brand for after dinner speeches, uh, for lectures, for writing, for doing other sort of commercial business. So there is a sort of intangible benefit, if you like, from being a big name at the BBC. And look, the BBC is a public sector broadcaster who is paid uh, through the public purse it pays these people, they have to make a decision about whether or not it's justified to pay those sorts of salaries. I imagine that in a, a climate where there is public sector pay freeze and people out there that watch these people on their televisions every day are suffering a pay squeeze, that some of these very, very big salaries might stick in the throat a bit. Beth, thanks very much. Well, let's return now to our top story, the publication by the BBC of its top earning talent. The Radio 2 presenter and former Top Gear frontman Chris Evans heads the list with around £2.2 .2 million a year. Strictly Come Dancing presenter Claudia Winkleman is the highest female earner, her salary around half a million pounds. Well, in the last few minutes, uh, the Director General of the BBC, Tony Hall, has been talking to Ian Woods. How awkward was that exchange on the Today programme this morning with Michelle Hussein? Not at all. I mean, I know the Today team uh, well, I know the presenters of many of these news programmes well, having worked in news myself. Um, and you know that they've got a very clear dividing line between their job to ask um, um, everybody uh, the difficult questions uh, and my job um, running the BBC. And I think she handled it extremely well. And uh, I think the BBC as a whole handles these things very well too. Let me give you an exchange that was on the Jeremy Vine programme a short time ago. Jeremy Vine, I'm listed as having a salary of 750k. How do you justify that? James Purnell, you were a brilliant broadcaster. Well, um, I don't know what you're asking me to comment on, but I think uh, Jeremy Vine is a fantastic broadcaster. Look, the principle we're trying to get over here is that um, our public expects us to hire great talent, uh, stars, great presenters, great correspondents to come and front our shows on radio and television. But because of the way we're paid by, by everybody, um, we've also got to make sure we're getting good value for money for that, which is why uh, I was able to say today that the talent bill uh, year on year is down by 10% and that everybody who works for the BBC uh, is paid at a discount to the market. So, you know, we're sort of answering the value for money, I hope, uh, understanding that you know that you know this is people's hard-earned pay coming towards to pay for the BBC, but also answering the, the the question which we get back from lots and lots of people, which is we want great programmes on the BBC. You fought the publication this week. Well, let's bring in Professor Jean Seaton, who's Professor of Media History at Westminster University and the official historian of the BBC. She's also the author of Under Siege, the BBC in the Crisis Years, and she joins us now from Aberystwyth. Uh, do you think this will change anything inside the BBC? Um, no, I think it's a healthy um, discussion of the cost of talent. And I think the cost of talent is something more broadly. It would be really helpful if we had a wider, more sane, whether we will, discussion of. The BBC has frequently made 
uh, stars and celebrities, celebrities is the wrong word, but it made, helped make talent. I was thinking, you know, Mark Rylance was always an absolutely amazing actor, had run the globe, an extraordinary man, but somehow our intimate uh, knowledge of him as uh, Cromwell, I think changed his role in the public eye and his, you know, his, in a way, his, his value. And that was a very good example of the BBC choosing the right, amazingly able, wonderful actor to add the most extraordinary interior life and humanity to a bruiser who was Cromwell. Um, and that, that is what we need the BBC to do. Now, talent is a very difficult issue. We could say, are all vice chancellors equally talented? Um, are footballers who get paid, who've got amazing talent, but get paid very large amounts of money because of the, not really because of them, but really because of the revenues that football is now you, producing, some people would argue is, is actually damaging local football. So I think we could have, I mean, it seems to me at the moment, the um, rather satisfyingly for politicians in a way, is the uh, currency of all pay is, is how much the Prime Minister has earned and earns. And it looks like the Prime Minister tends to earn less than everybody else, which may not be sensible. So I think... That... Sorry, sorry to bring in, but in, in terms of the BBC uh, promoting talent, creating talent, as you say, does it surprise you that, that, that men seem to be so much more talented than women? <laughs> well, I speak as a female professor who I imagine most of my career... I'm pretty sure most of my career, men have probably been paid much more than me. Um, uh, I think that there's something very interesting to be untangled there. We found that it's happening in publishing, which is a kind of niche business. We've known it's been happening in uh, acting for a very long time in the film business. Um, I think we just need to think about, you know, the qualities that different kinds of people men and women and all sorts of other varieties. It seems to me one of the BBC's jobs is to find talent in areas that we haven't known. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm cynically uh, uh, used to these, to these things. I think they're changing. And I think that we need to have a more sensible, more grown up discussion. The BBC has been cut hugely. It's got much less money than it used to have. As it goes forward, it's been cut hugely. Has it dealt with those cuts in the most sensible way is a really interesting question. But Sky, for instance, uh, has much more money to spend on talent. Mm. I wish my salary had reached that 150,000 <laughs> bracket. Um, well, so do I. I mean, this, this, mm. would, be, this would be very, very interesting. Um, uh, but as I say, I think there's a wider public discussion to be had about the, how you get talent, what it means to be a great comedy writer or a great... Mm comedy, you know, somebody with a real sense for the moment, somebody who gives people delight. Like, you know, we don't have, an, I don't think we have the equivalent of Morecambe and Wise, but famously they weren't paid so much at the BBC and they went off to commercial television and it didn't work so well and they came back to the BBC. So I think that women and women's talents are classically not valued in the same way as most times. It was brilliant on Today, it was Michelle Hussein. Uh, you know, Michelle Hussein is the most glamorous, intelligent, polite, acute uh, today questioner, and she was asking him some very hard questions. The other things I'd say is that the BBC is very good at beating itself up. M long may it go on. OK, Jane Seaton, good to talk to you. Thank you very much, Professor Jane Seaton there. But first, we want to talk to you about the BBC, which has revealed its highest paid on-screen earners after being forced to do so by the government. Chris Evans tops the list, followed by Gary Lineker and Graham Norton. The figures reveal a huge disparity between men and women, with men making up two-thirds of those on the list. Let's uh, take a look at those salaries in more detail, should we? Chris Evans leads the pack. Radio 2 former Top Gear presenter earns at least £2.2 .2 million a year. Next, it's Match of the Day host Gary Lineker, who's paid between £1.75 and £1.8 million a year by the BBC. Then, Graham Norton on around £850,000. The highest earning woman on the list is Claudia Winkleman. The Strictly presenter is paid up to £500,000 a year. The next highest paid woman is Alex Jones, who earns between £400,000 and £450,000 a year. It's £50,000 less than her one-show co-presenter, Matt Baker. 
Newsreader Fiona Bruce is paid around £350,000. That's paid considerably less than her fellow anchor Hugh Edwards, who earns between £550 and £600,000 a year. Similarly, Michelle Hussein's £200 to £250,000 salary is dwarfed by her Today programme co-host John Humphreys. Uh, he's paid around £600,000 a year. Of the 96 names on the list, 62 are male, while just 34 are female. Average man on the list is paid £295,000, while the average woman earns £210,000. Director General Lord Hall said that he's determined to do away with gender inequality at the BBC. Of all the new people we've put in positions uh, of presenting or, or as stars over the last three years, 60% are now women. Now, w w what I've been saying today is uh, we've made a start, we've done fine, but there's so much more I want to do. And that's why by 2020, I want to have an equality on radio and television between men and women, uh, both in terms of, of, of them as presenters, as stars, but also in terms of pay too. Joined by the former BBC chair, Lord Grade, um, with us now live. As you can see, hello to you, Lord Grade. Thank you for joining us on Sky yeah. News this afternoon. To what extent do you accept responsibility for women not earning the same as men at the BBC previously? Uh, the job of the board is not to employ people. The job of the board is to make sure that money is spent wisely. So I don't think we got into that, that level of detail. One was always aware that successive directors general of the BBC have had this on their agenda and Tony Hall has made very clear today uh, that it's very much on his agenda and has been for some time and he's making good progress. The list you've just seen is not comprehensive because there are a lot of performers, male and female, who work for independent production companies not directly employed by the BBC so that the numbers are very, very, very misleading. So you weren't aware of this page gap, uh, pay gap rather, when you were the chair? No, I wasn't, no. You should have been there, should you? Uh, probably. Probably. Uh, but the BBC was in a terrible state at the time I, I moved in and we had to find a whole new management team and reorganise the place and get a new charter. So uh, uh, I, I, I know that Mark Thompson, who was the Director General that I, the board appointed under me, uh, had this very much on his, his agenda. So uh, these things don't change overnight. But women's pay wasn't uh, important on that agenda because you had so many other things I to do. I didn't say that. I, I didn't say it wasn't important. Of course it's important. But to take some uh, figures today that don't necessarily represent the whole picture for the reasons I've explained is very misleading. You feel that the government's crossed a line here. How so? The government's duty is to make sure that the BBC spends the licence fee money in a way that is efficient uh, and value for money. It is the job of the board of the BBC to micromanage and this is an attempt by, by the government to undermine I think the board of the BBC. If the government had issues about it, presenter pay uh, they should have asked the board to look at it and not uh, demanded this disclosure. All that's happened is it's, it's feeding the media, obviously it's a great story, but in the end it will cost the BBC a lot of money because there are a lot of agents out there uh, with clients uh, who uh, salaries will level up, they won't level down, uh, and there'll be a huge feeding frenzy uh, as, as the argument, as these numbers are disclosed, people are saying, well, if, if she's worth that, my client's worth that. So it, it's, it's just a mess in my view, and I think it should never have been allowed to happen. Um, no black, Asian or minority ethnic stars featured in the list of those earning more than 300,000. Surprised at that? Uh, that's a matter for the Director General and the staff of the BBC and the board of the BBC, not for me. I don't, I don't have anything to do with the place anymore. I just watch uh, as a bystander, as an interested bystander. Were you aware of it when you were the chair? Uh, no, not, not particularly that time, no. Uh, that'll take us back round to that argument we had a moment or two ago, so I'll just leave that it in abeyance, should I? It, um, it, talk to it, me it, about you saying indeed. that the work at the BBC for a discount doesn't uh, look like it, does it? I mean, they're pretty impressive salaries to most people who are watching this afternoon. Well, you'd need to know what other people get working in other channels. Uh, you'd have to understand that. This is, this is just, you're just seeing a, a, a bit of the story, you're not seeing the whole story. 
But in any event, I find it, I find it distasteful that, that confidential contracts are, are, are being overridden and made public in a way that is, is not helpful to anybody, in my view. Well, why do you say that, Lord Graham? I mean, why is transparency not good for business? Why are you not, you know, if you're saying that people are earning less than potentially they are earning in other... Well, uh, sorry, go on. The, the difference is this is about freelance talent that's free to go anywhere. The executives of the BBC, their salaries and bonuses and pensions, etc., are all disclosed in line with the private sector. But this is freelance talent. There's a free market for talent, and I think the talent is entitled to confidentiality. I just don't see wh where this is going to get us. All I can see, as I say, is it will end up costing the BBC more money, or the numbers will get hidden because people won't want to work directly for the BBC. They'll only want to work through uh, independent production companies when their salaries uh, and deals won't be exposed in this way. It's good for the consumer though, isn't it, Lord Grade, i.e. the viewers, because they can see these figures and from what you're saying, people are being paid less at the BBC than they would be paid at other commercial organisations. So we're getting a good deal. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a free market. A talent is free to work where it wants and the BBC must make professional judgments about what they pay the talent. It's the job of the board of the BBC uh, to monitor this and to make sure that the BBC isn't uh, overpaying in, in, in some instances. So I think it's a matter for the board. It's not a matter for these people's contracts to be debated uh, a, a across the media and in, in Parliament. It's a mat matter that's delegated to the BBC. Mrs May says it's uh, a good idea and she wants to see it happen time and again. What would you say in response to her? Well, I, I, I would like to debate her on, on the issue. And are we going to be told how much Simon Rattle gets to conduct the proms or the, the stars who, the opera stars who get a lot of money and work at the Opera House or at the ENO, all publicly subsidised? This is, this is just not fair on talent, I don't think. Good to talk to you, Lord Grey. Thank you for joining us on Sky News this afternoon. Thanks. Thank you. Let us know your thoughts. Now today, for the first time, the BBC has unveiled the earnings of some of its highest paid stars. The move, forced by the government, means the corporation must outline how much it pays on-air talent, earning more than £150,000. Well, Chris Evans is the highest paid presenter, with up to £2.2 million a year. Gary Lineker is next, earning up to £1.8 million. Then comes Graham Norton on £900,000, though that figure doesn't include his TV chat show. Other well-known faces include Jeremy Vine, who's paid up to £750,000, John Humphreys on up to £650,000, and Hugh Edwards, who earns between £550,000 and £599,000. But there's controversy over how many women make the list, just a third. Claudia Winkleman is the highest paid, with up to £499,000. Then Alex Jones on up to £449,000, with Fiona Bruce receiving up to £400,000. Well, the BBC's Director General, Lord Hall, has been defending the payments, saying the corporation is operating in a very competitive market. Our media correspondent, David Silito, has more details. His report contains some flashing images. The secrets are out. Gary Lineker of Match of the Day is the second highest paid star on the BBC. Behind him is Graham Norton. But at number one on the list published today, it's Chris Evans. £2.2 million for Radio 2 and Top Gear. There was a little crowd of reporters waiting as he left work today. We are the ultimate public company, I think. And therefore, I think that he's probably, he's probably on balance right and proper that people know what we get paid, I think. And here are the details. Gary Lineker's deal is heading towards £1.8 million. Radio 2's Jeremy Vine takes home just under £750,000. Hugh Edwards earns between £550,000 and £599,000. And John Humphreys from the Today programme and Mastermind gets almost £650,000. And today, he was the one facing the tough questions. What do I do on paper? Absolutely nothing that justifies that huge amount of money, if you compare me with lots of other people who do visible. If a doctor saves a child's life or a nurse comforts a dying person. However, we operate in a marketplace. Um, I think I provide a fairly useful service. I mean, somebody has to do the job of trying to hold power to account. What's also notable are the names that are missing. No David Dimbleby. No David Attenborough. No Mary Berry. Anyone paid through an independent production company or the BBC's commercial arm 
isn't on the list. So Graham Norton's earnings from his production company are probably not included. But it's still a list of 96 names earning more than £150,000. We are constantly working at ensuring that we get the balance right between our public who want to have great shows presented by stars and great presenters and them also wanting to know that their money, and it's their money, public money, is being spent properly and that's always a balance. And over the last two or three years, yes, some um, key presenters and others have taken pay cuts. But is it enough? On the BBC tour today in Salford, there were some who felt it could go further. Yeah, they probably should be well paid, they're doing high pressure jobs, a lot's expected of them, but it's hard to imagine earning sums like that. So I'm going to say no, they're not worth that. It's a national treasure, it's really important, so we should be able to pay competitive rates. But I'm a bit shocked at what Chris Evans gets paid. They are on large, large amounts, but I've noticed that the women are on a lot less. Indeed, the highest paid woman only just makes it into the top ten. Claudia Winkleman at around £450,000. Indeed, looking at the list, two-thirds of the names are men. In the top 20, there are just five women. And when it comes to black or Asian or BAME presenters, there's not one in the top 20. And this is licence fee payers' money. They need to know where the money is being spent and that they're getting that value for money. And I think by having that transparency, we have the opportunity to see where there's maybe gender pay gaps and where there's uh, issues about BAME uh, presenters perhaps not being paid as much as others. Meanwhile, at Radio 2, the listeners were turning the tables on Jeremy Vine. Are you embarrassed to pick up your paycheck? And outside, more questions. I'm just sorry, I think the BBC is really hurting today. Where is everyone? The highest paid BBC actor? Derek Thompson, Charlie from Casualty. Of course, most actors are off the list because they work for independents. And with Amazon and Netflix, talent costs are rising. It's not just ITV outbidding the BBC anymore. But for those paying the licence fee, today has been an eye-opening glimpse into where their money has been going. David Silito, BBC News. Well, our media editor, Amol Rajan, is, is here. Amol, this is clearly an uncomfortable day for the BBC. It didn't want to do this. It had its reservations. And one wonders what the longer-term ramifications of all this might be. Well, Clive, the politics of it are so fascinating. As you say, the BBC didn't want to do this. They fought a really strong uh, fight against the government around the time of the last charter renewal, saying that they shouldn't disclose or be forced to disclose names. And they made two arguments. They said, first of all, this was going to be inflationary. It would, read to, it would lead to pay rises. And they also said it would be a poachers charter that other broadcasters would swoop in for the BBC's top talent. Now if that doesn't happen over the coming weeks and months then the government is going to think you know what actually the BBC made these arguments and you know what it turns out they were wrong and it's possible Clive that next year they'll say you know what transparency is a good thing it's healthy it's flushed out some major uh, issues that need to be addressed let's have more of it either lowering the threshold next year or saying perhaps people paid by independent production companies should also be on this list so based on the conversations that I've had here at the BBC or in Westminster and across the industry I'd have said this is the start of a pretty long ordeal for the corporation. All right. I'm all many thanks. I'm all Rajan there. Now, there are few women and even fewer ethnic minority stars. The BBC has published its list of top earners to an outcry from over diversity. Theresa May demanded to know why the corporation paid women less than men for doing the same job, while a number of high profile presenters have been forced to defend their salaries. That of the manager has been to ask the BBC's director general why there is such a pay disparity. It unveiled the very first female Doctor Who, but today the BBC is facing a sexism row that isn't science fiction, as the salary secrets of its top talent are revealed. For some, it's already made for uncomfortable broadcasting. Here's the BBC's fourth highest earner, having to justify himself to a listener. I do think you're overpaid. <laughs> um... I don't even really want to answer that because I feel like it's not the no, moment no, for me. You, you spend your lifetime asking people questions. Yeah. Now I'm asking you a direct question. I think... Are you, do you think you, you, the rest of the BBC, the staff, Claudia Winkleman, Chris Evans, all them, do you think they're grossly overpaid? Some are. And Chris Evans was asked if it's right he's paid more than the Prime Minister. Is it right? Yeah. Is it correct? <laughs> well, I am paid more than the Prime Minister. I'm paid. 
Nine presenters are in the top eight pay bands, with Chris Evans getting over £2.2 million. Just one woman, Claudia Winkleman, is among them, but her 450000 pay puts her in the lowest tier of this group. I am not satisfied um, with uh, the gender pay gap uh, in the BBC. In the last three years, since I've been really pushing this, of the new people that we've either brought on or promoted, 60% of those have been women. How many people from black and minority ethnic backgrounds are in the top ten? Uh, there aren't any in the, in no, the top there ten. There aren't any. Yeah, but, but, are uh, you comfortable but, about that? But no, and, and uh, in, the, in the people who we're announcing today, paid over 150, uh, the 96, um, 11% are from BAME backgrounds. We're on a journey here. We're not there. We're going to get there. How many BBC staff are paid under £20,000? Um, uh, we, we, I can't give you that figure. It's two and a half thousand. Mm. That's come from the uh, union, Beck to. Mm. And they say that when they look at these salaries, they think it's unjustifiable that you would pay certain people huge amounts of money. We have different pay rates for different people. Um, I'm keen that we pay people properly. But equally, when it comes to presenters and when it comes to top talent, uh, you also have to recognise your inner market. In news and current affairs, the market doesn't exist in the same way. I mean, Sky News is not about to poach Hugh Edwards, so how can you justify paying him half a million Because there is a market likewise in, in news but and current some, affairs But presenters. some of these presenters are not going to get the same amount of salary at other news broadcasters. It's just not going to happen. I, I, I can tell you, I've been in on the conversations, and uh, I'm not going to go to any names, but people are, um, are, are promised large sums to leave. Some, like John Simpson, argue the government is trying to damage the BBC in forcing this transparency. But others believe it's about value for money. There are 226 people, executives and talent, that earn these high salaries. Many of them people you haven't heard of and doing jobs that it's not entirely clear what they do. And people probably both within the BBC and licence fee payers will question that. Today's list has some glaring omissions. Some stars are paid by production companies. And who knows how much they earn. After today, the public knows more, but not everything, about the pay of almost 100 of television and radio's best-known presenters. What is true is that radio host Chris Evans earns at least two and a quarter million pounds, whereas the highest-paid female presenter, Claudia Winkleman, who presides over Strictly with Tess Daly, gets approximately half a million. Who decides who's worth more, and why is the list so heavily skewed towards men? The Director General of the BBC, Tony Hall, began the day promising that in three years' time the BBC will deliver pay and gender parity. But how on earth are they going to do that? I'll be asking James Purnell in a moment, but first here's Chris Cook. Today, the BBC published the salaries of its best paid on-screen personalities. It's released the names of the 96 people on more than £150,000 a year and their pay. So we've learned a lot today about the TV labour market. We know that Newsnight's own Evan Davis and Kirsty Walk are both on that list. But there's lots that we don't know. For example, we don't know anything about the wages paid to people via intermediaries. For example, people who have their own production companies. We also don't know what exactly people have done to justify the wages that have been published today. So are they working seven days or one day a week? These salaries are very large. One caller to the £700,000 Jeremy Vine today thought too large. I can't see how we can justify earning them. You and the rest of the staff of the BBC can justify picking up a paycheck up every week where there are men and women in this country who are working their fingers to the bone, who don't get nowhere near the money you're earning and are on the minimum wage and struggling to live. I have laid uh, today before Parliament a BBC charter... This former culture secretary introduced these transparency rules. There are two things which I think need to be borne in mind. Firstly, but for some people, actually working for the BBC is a privilege and they are willing to accept a bit less than they might elsewhere because it's the BBC. Um, and I think that is right and admirable. Secondly, there comes a point where the BBC, I think, has to say, and it's for them to judge this, but they have to say, OK, if you can command a much higher salary elsewhere or you've been offered it, then good luck, you know, we wish you all the best, but I'm afraid, you know, we simply can't match that. 
But does the BBC need to pay those sums to keep its talent from competitors? John Humphreys, the Today programme and mastermind presenter, earns more than £600,000 a year. I would have thought it highly unlikely that I would leave the BBC to go somewhere else. Um, why should I? It's the best job there is. But that's the thing, it keeps coming back to this. Why are we paying people who want to work at the BBC and can't imagine leaving so much money? It's an interesting notion, isn't it? That you, you should only get um, a lot of money if you dislike the job you're doing. What is it that you think the BBC thinks is worth the money they spend on you? I don't know what you mean. So what, you mean? Why, what is it that you think the BBC... You mean what is my special, what unique is, talent? What is your special, I mean, unique talent? I don't think I've got one. I mean, I, I, I do what I do. I ask people questions of, uh, that, that, that I think, that I hope the public wants answered. Um, I, um, and, and I think I do that reasonably competently. Gender has emerged as perhaps the most important issue to come out of this list. Around two thirds of the names on the list are of men. The problem, though, of gender can't be looked at without looking at age. If you look at under 50s on the list, there are actually roughly even numbers of men and women. The problem comes, though, that if you look at the over 50s, there are 45 men on the list and just 11 women. There are four times as many men over 50 earning more than £150,000 a year at the BBC than women. The BBC has a woman problem, but it has a particular older woman problem. Agents like Mary Greenham think the BBC is serious about this. My relationship with the BBC and my workings with the BBC goes back many years and they are an organisation that do want to get it right, they will get it right, they already have measures in place to get it right and they will work with other organisations to make sure that in 20 years time you know this isn't a problem and we're just talking about equality. I think it's a great time for women at the BBC. I think as a result of today, more women will get employed than men. So the message to me being top talent manager is get more women on my books because now's a golden time to get women more jobs at the BBC. So watch out BBC producer. I'm gonna be calling you the more ladies. These 96 names are not representative. What they get paid is, I promise you, not a normal BBC salary. But the patterns they show up are ones worth paying attention to. Chris Cook, well, James Purnell is the BBC's Director of Radio and Education. He's here, and I'm also joined by Liz Forgan. She's an old media hand who's been Senior Executive at Channel 4, The Guardian, and here at the BBC, as well as Chair of the Arts Council. I'm going to come to you in a moment, Liz. But first, uh, James Purnell, um, Tony Hall has promised that there will be equality uh, on air and in pay by 2020. Can we just clarify categories? This is all on air. Uh, we've said all on air we're going to get 50-50 and we've also said we're going to get rid of the gender pay gap. So that's the gap between all men and women employed at the, the BBC, which is currently 10%. So that means that off air, you know, whether it is people in graphics, whether it's people in editing, whether it's people in planning, will all have pay parity by 2020, all of them? Uh, on average. So the whole, when you compare what women earn compared to what men earn, you will get rid of the gap which exists at the moment, which is about uh, 10%. This is something that all uh, organisations mm. who employ more than 250 people are going to have to face up to. We're all going to have our, our gender pay gap um, uh, disclosed this time next year. And we've said something which I don't think anyone else has said, which is we want to get rid of the gender pay gap. We're already a bit better than the national average, but we want to go further. Well, let's now look then at on air. So you're going to get rid of uh, the pay gap and you're going to get rid of the gender imbalance in terms of on air talent. Yep. How are you going to do that? So we've you already done three it. years. Yeah, so we need to change the mix of people. So that's about um, when people uh, retire or leave to go somewhere else, you need to bring on a more diverse mix. So we've been doing that. So 60% of the kind of new entrants onto this list are women, 20% uh, from ethnic minority backgrounds. So that has improved this list. We'll do more of that. And then obviously we need to look at pay mm -hmm. as well. So, you know, Quite a lot of men have been taking pay cuts uh, already. John Humphrey said that today. Yeah. Uh, and will you be expecting air. more male on-air talent to take a pay cut? No, I'm not going to start negotiating live on air. But well, something's going to give. That's clearly one of the levers that we can pull. Yes, absolutely. And we have been doing that. So, but you know, it, it's, it's not a it's not a cookie cutter approach. With every single one of these contracts, we go through and look at their ma market value. But hang on, value. how are you going to actually do that? I mean, how are you going to say? Well, you can say to Gary Lineker, you know, you're earning whatever you're earning, 2.6 million. Can you just give 600,000 up because we want to bring on new female talent in sport? How will that go down? Well, we've been doing that already. 
So you uh, might do it to Gary Lineker, for example. No, I'm not going to start going into individual contracts. Okay. I hope you understand. But what actually is parity in terms of uh, on air pay? Is it same hours, same job? That's a very good question. I think if someone's got exactly the same job, the same experience, the same history, the same audience value, of course they're paid the same amount. With top talent, that's very rarely the case. It's very hard to compare people on this list. So, so what we do to get the right talent is we have an individual negotiation with them. It's a rigorous process. We do research. We look at what the audience okay. wants, what they bring to their BBC, the commercial value, and we negotiate something based on that. Right. So let's just, let's just look at an example then. You've got, for example, you have, say, three male presenters and three female presenters on the Today programme. They're broadcasting for the same amount of time. A lot of them have got extremely good experience. Mm. Uh, would you expect them to get the same money? I wouldn't actually because, you know, John Humphreys obviously brings something pretty unique. He's the outstanding uh, interview of his generation. He's got a unique value to the BBC and that is something that we recognise. Like all, you know... But you recognise it when he doesn't even need it recognised. It's extraordinary because he said there that actually he didn't look for pay rises but he kept getting them. And he's also said that he won't go anywhere else. So actually, that's not about the market. You just want to give John Humphreys lots of money. I, I've never said it's just about the market. The market is one factor. It's also the audience value, the value to the BBC. You know, actually, on the Today programme, the lowest paid person is a man. Well, actually, that's not... You, you, you take, we, we can go into the detail of that, but that's not actually quite right because there's a different uh, equation that operates in the Today programme. But seeing you mention the Today programme in that way, um, you know, Sarah Montague is a senior presenter on that programme. She's not been there as long as John Humphreys. She's a senior presenter on that programme. She has over 100 programmes a year. She's not even on the list. How on earth does that happen? She's a brilliant broadcaster and... The reason I'm... So, I can't go into individual no, details, but, you, but, uh, but the lowest paid person out of those but presenters... But that's, that's not what I'm asking. That is absolutely not what I'm asking. She has been in that programme for uh, more than 12 years, and somehow she's not on the list. Isn't that a mistake? Look, that is one of the things that we'll continue to look at right. as we do people's contracts. Now, um, what happens when one of the Today presenters... I'm sticking with the Today because it's just a kind of obvious example... Uh, ...gets a very, very uh, lucrative uh, offer from, say, LBC, and they come to you and they say, we've a very lucrative offer from LBC. Do you say, as John Whittingdale would suggest, you might say, that's fantastic, go. Mm -hmm. Or do you give them more money, in which case suddenly the pay parity in the Today programme goes completely out the window? It depends. You know, we, we sometimes let people go. We sometimes walk away from, from negotiations. That's happened recently at the BBC in terms of, uh, of news presenters. Normally what we'd go and do and say, OK, well, there's a, there's a market value here. Does that change the package we should offer people? And we try and make an offer which is competitive, but normally less than the but market. But if that then puts the parity on the Today programme yeah. presenters completely out the window and is a terrible imbalance, would you just give them more money as well? We would do it basically. The key criterion is a value to the audience. That, that's what we'd start with. And sometimes that does mean you get... Yeah. That's why these comparisons are hard to make. But, but it's interesting because what are we, what, what's going to happen here? Because the BBC, we're constantly being told is there's no money sloshing around the BBC. Yeah. By and large, especially in the older categories, men get paid a lot more than women. So are you going to take money from men and give it to women? We're actually making lots of savings to fund this. So we, we have been reducing talent costs, but we've made lots of other savings, like £75 million on the IT programme. So there are other ways of funding inflation if that's mm -hmm. what happens. We're clearly going to try and stop wage inflation as well. So as I said, we can change the mix, we can bring on a more diverse group of people, and we can also look at the relativities of pay. Thanks very much for the moment, uh, James Parnell. Uh, Liz Forgan, you were here 20 years ago. Should you have done more 20 years ago? Because, you know, as, we, as Chris Cook said, it gets more difficult the older the presenters are. Probably yes. And I think about myself. It never occurred to me to ask what the pay range was of the job I was going to the BBC to get. Now, if I had been a man, I probably would have done. So I think women have some responsibility also in this history that we are less assertive, have been in the past anyway, less assertive than men. Don't look at me like that. That's say, not how an excuse. Would that, how would that go down that is, is what I want to say. That is not an excuse. That is not a justification. It may be partly a historical explanation. Mm -hmm. But of course, it's, a, it's an indefensible state of affairs and it's got to be remedied but immediately. You, but you were, you were very critical of the, the, the notion that the BBC had to disclose. But actually, if this is the big bang, and as a result of that disclosure, as James Purnell says, we're going to have pay parity, gender parity, on screen and off screen in three years' time, that's better, isn't it? I think that would be a brilliant outcome of this day, which in other respects I find quite sad. 
I mean, I think there is an overwhelming argument for the BBC to disclose more information than it has done, but you can, there is absolutely no need to have individual salaries in order to tell you what's going on with the BBC. Mm -hmm. It could have published data split by number of people in pay categories, split by gender, split by race, split by anything you like, would have told us what was going on with BBC Pay. Individual salary is another matter. Mm -hmm. If you think, uh, as James uh, Purnell seems to think, that part of this can be solved by taking money away from the men and giving it to women, is that a very good plan? Because it looks like we're doing charity for the women. I think that's not a the basis for a policy. I mean, as James says, you, the BBC is a big place. It's money here and money there. And if that is really a priority for the BBC, which it clearly now has to be, then there are ways of addressing this issue without taking money away from men directly. I think that would be a very crude way of going about your But if you um, look at the, uh, the inevitability that there will be kinks and different problems around the bend, I mean, what, what Tony Hall committed the BBC to today, given that we are halfway through 2017, is to have this fixed essentially in two and a half years time. Well, I would be amazed if he manages it, frankly. I'm sure he means to, but you know, as James started to illustrate, this is very complicated stuff. There is never just one reason why somebody's paid what they're paid. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds mm -hmm. of ingredients into deciding what anybody's worth. And this one is now going to trump everything else. But do you is... think it's possible to do it without pushing up costs, really? Well, it will have to. Just turning to you on that, how is that possible, James Purnell, that you're going to be able to do this without adding to costs? Well, for the, the, you know, the licence peers watching this tonight as well. Yeah, no, I think that's a very good point, and that's why we fought against this disclosure, because we thought it would create an inflationary pressure. I mean, to give you an example, we... Two examples, maybe. We've done it with breakfast shows on local radio. Mm -hmm. Used to be 14% mm -hmm. women, mm -hmm. it's now 50-50. We did that in two years, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. Similarly, with our, our pay for the whole of our staff, you know, we've uh, constantly had disproportionate increases for the lowest paid. Again, that will help with, with this target. So it's a matter of putting all the levers that we can. Our pay gap is 10%, so, you know, I think we are... Uh, hopeful but that the we 10% can... is still a lot to do it for two and a half years without actually saying to some of the well-paid men in the BBC, you look at that huge difference in the top 10 of those uh, 100. Massive difference proportionately what men get to, to women. Are you going to actually make the men take a pay cut? We're going to look at individual negotiations. I'm not going to get into that no, one but, but I'm talking about the, I'm not asking for individual negotiation. I'm actually asking you across the board. Are you going to ask men to take pay cuts? We are, have been doing that, and they, people on this list have been. They're disproportionately men, so men have been taking, taking pay cuts. John Humphrey spoke about that today. But, but, if, but, but we're, not, we're not going to do it in a sort of box-ticky way. It is no. going to be based on getting the right talent. And if we were starting from today, mm -hmm. as if we hadn't discovered anything, yes, it would be very hard to get there. Actually, we've been working on this for three years now. 60% of the people coming onto this list are women. We can build on that, and we're aiming to get to equality by 2020. And probably the only organisation I know that's doing that. Thank you both very much indeed. Yeah.